Kia ora everyone. Uh, I think that's almost everyone we've got. Uh, so kia ora koutou, kroiso, and welcome to our second workshop. Uh, thanks for being here for our online education series for our community strength and balance instructors and providers all across the motu. Uh, so this is a partnership between the Live Stronger for Longer team and uh, at ACC and Sport Taranaki. Um, my name is Beth, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm the lead agent for Counties Monaco Region up in uh, Tamaki Makora, Auckland. Um, so before we begin, everyone, um, even though you're on mute, feel free to join in. I'm just going to read the uh, ACC Karakia. Faia, faia, faia te tika, faia te pono, faia te aroha, mō te orangatangata, kia puta, kia te fai au. Kia te au marama, homie, huie, taikie. All right. Okay. So, the uh, purpose of this workshop today um, is, or oh, for the series, sorry, is to provide you um, with information and content that will hopefully increase your understanding of older adults' health and to help inform your class delivery. Um, if you have any questions during the session, pop them in the chat and we will address them at the end and um, we'll go through it at the conclusion. The session is going to be recorded just to remind everyone and um, what, what we'll do in is uh, a link will be sent out there in a couple of days after each presentation and that'll direct you to ACC's YouTube page, the YouTube channel I should say, um, where you'll be able to watch it at your leisure and send it on to people you know might benefit from it. So, on to our fabulous speaker today. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the wonderful Hilary Blackstock. Hilary is the Community Strength and Balance Coordinator at Sport Taranaki, and she's actually uh, the reason a lot of us are here today. So, huge props to the amazing Hilary. Um, Hills has been working with older adults now for over 20 years. She actually fell into the job, <laughs> like some of us do. Um, after being diagnosed with postnatal depression, Hillary found play and play fit. So through that experience, has discovered many benefits uh, that it, uh, so play fit basically be benefits so many different age groups. It's an honour to hear her speak today, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Hillary. Thanks, Beth. Um, welcome to you all. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, so today we're going to cover play, what play is. Um, and, you know, we all have different, I guess, ideas around what play is. We're going to talk about the benefits of play. And as much as we're going to talk about the benefits of play for older adults, most of those, all of those, filter down regardless of age. Um, and then finally, the second part of the session, we're going to go through some of the activities that I use in my classes um, that hopefully you can take away parts of, all of, um, or just inspire and give you some other ideas that you might like to try. Um, as Beth said, please chuck any questions that you've got in the chat um, and yeah, we'll get started. So I didn't really start out life very playful. Um, and as Beth said, kind of found play through, um, I guess, my own journey to feel better about how things were going. Um, and then through my own benefits and experience have been using that with adults of all ages um, in the more recent probably 10 to 15 years. So I just want to start with a quote that you've probably all heard of, and it doesn't just uh, you know, reside with play, but there's lots of other things that you will probably feel that it fits with. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. And yeah, as I said, you know, things like getting up and down off the floor, it's not often an age thing. It's just something we've stopped doing. Then we go to do it and we think, ah, I can't do it anymore. And so with practice, we can all, you know, become more playful depending on where we start from. So what is play? Play is in its purest form, it's free, it's unstructured, um, and it's often used in relation to children. That's where we hear it the most, um, because it's how children experience and learn about their own world and where they fit. Um, play can also be games, takaro, 
Um, and you know, for some people, it's it's just being playful. It doesn't we it doesn't have to kind of have rules and have a place. It can just be the way we do things. And I don't know if you've ever tried to encourage you know people to do something they don't want to do, like your kids cleaning up. Um, you know, you will find a way to challenge and make things playful uh, to get the job done sometimes. Play comes more naturally to some than others. You know, some people you naturally will have kind of a playful energy about them and other people it's not so. Um, and this is the same with our older adults. You'll know people in your classes who, you know, just want to have a go and, you know, want to be involved and others who will stand back. Um, and there, when we introduce play to a class, if we're not already doing it, there are a few tips and tricks that we will go over later that will just help you, I guess, bring play into their minds and also to bring in, you know, ways to integrate it with those people who might not feel comfortable with play. Um, because some of our older adults have lived, you know, they've lived through depression and things like that. And so, the education system back then wasn't built around play. And so play play for some older adults is a completely new concept. Um, and so just keep that in mind and you'll know your own participants and where they kind of fit on that. As much as it's important for our participants, it's also important for us. If you're a really playful person, you'll find adding this kind of stuff in easy. It's second nature. You don't kind of second guess it. For other people where I started, Leading something that you are uncomfortable with and unfamiliar with is hard. So choose wisely, think about your own comfort levels around play um, before you choose something that might fit into your class. So these really cool photos um, were taken about a year ago by uh, my friend who's also a photographer. And I took a class of our older adults down a hundred metre pathway down into a garden, which was a very steep path. I was a little bit kind of unsure about taking them down there. But all we took was a bag of balls and they had an absolute ball. We just did things that they hadn't done for years. Um, and when we got to the bottom, there was a swing. And there was, we ranged from about 75 to 95. Um, and almost every single one of those people chose to hop on the swing and then commented later that they hadn't done it for ages and it had made them feel really good. Um, so sometimes these activities might be silly or they might be something they haven't done for ages, but it actually brings them back to that time when there was joy or they might have been at the playground with their grandkids or their own kids. Um, and those memories are really important. So play in a session, I often will um, start my game with a session start my session with a game um, and obviously some games are better to use at the start um, some are better later on but I find that starting with a game really helps to bring people together and bring people to the present so no matter our age when we turn up to class and it can happen for leaders as well you might have had, you know, a whole heap of things happen before you get to class. You might be feeling a little bit rattled. Um, you know, you might be tired. Your posture might be out. It's the same for them. When we start a session with play, it allows people to leave those thoughts at the door. Um, and it's amazing once you see it, mood improves almost instantly and so does posture. And if we think about having good posture, this allows for us to move better. It allows for more physical gains. Um, and it also reduces our chance of injury, right? So having good posture to start the session is actually a really, um, you know, from a physical and a, a health and safety perspective is really quite good. Uh, so this is a game I quite often use at the start of a session and I thought we'd start it today, both to calm me and to get you into the spirit of play. Um, I would usually do it in peers obviously that's a little bit tough today if you're sitting with others feel free to do it with them but what i thought we'd do is i'll do the first 30 seconds and you'll copy me and then you'll do the second 30 seconds and i can't see you so i'm going to go off beth because poor beth's the only one i can see i'm going to copy her faces for the next 30 seconds she has no idea i'm going to drop her in it sorry beth 
So before we start, I just want you to give a little thought to how you're feeling right now. So on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling? How's your energy? How's your mood? Um, you know, how are you feeling generally? Have a think about that. Give yourself a score from one to five. One is you're feeling dreadful. It was a terrible weekend. The rugby went wrong and everything else hasn't gone to plan. And five, it is the best day ever. All righty, so pick somewhere that you feel there. If you want to share it with us in the chat, feel free. And once you've got that, what I want you to do is take a little sit and reach. So it's like a little squat, but you're going to reach forward with your arms. Take one or two of those and just feel how it feels. Take note of any restrictions that you feel, any uh, discomfort, any tightness, um, and just store that away in your head as well. I'm going to do a one minute activity. And as I said, you usually do this with your partner. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a partner with you, you can do it with them. Some of you are having a great blooming day. Look at that, three and a half, four and five. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull faces and you can go as hard out, as crazy as you want with your faces. Try and copy me if you can. All right, and then after 30 seconds, we are going to switch over and I'm going to copy Paul Beck. All right, so. Usually if you're doing it with a buddy, there's lots of laughter, um, which is <laughs> nice. We're a bit more energetic with a smile as well. So um, yeah, almost no one feels worse with that one. There's usually a lot of laughter. It's actually, sometimes you'll find quite hard to pull different faces for 30 seconds. Um, so you'll find that there's chitter chatter as well. Um, but the movement in your face actually um, allows the rest of your body to relax and the endorphins from having a laugh at, at yourself and your partner uh, will also help um, with feeling better physically and actually having a, uh, less restriction lower down the, the chain so that's just a little one that you can try um, if it was helpful for you it might be helpful for your participants as well and it's guaranteed to bring a laugh except well not except but you might find people take a little bit of time to warm up to pulling faces like that in a public place cool so um we're going to go through some of the benefits of play now um, like I said, these are relevant for everyone, no matter the age, but we'll talk about it from a perspective of older adults, which is kind of where, um, where we sit from day to day. So uh, the first thing we'll go through is mental stimulation. Play challenges your mind. And obviously as we go through the games later, you'll find some will challenge your mind more than others. Um, but if you've got a group where, um, you know, cognitive decline is high on their thoughts, it's high on their priorities, then choosing games that make them think is actually going to get usually a better buy-in than one that's a little less mental and more about the physical. So um, play promotes your cognitive function, your mental agility, um, and actually just uses your brain in a problem-solving or a different way to what we generally use it from day to day. Um, and you, you'll all know that during different life stages, we have different requirements on challenges on our brain for things like problem solving. So adding these kind of things in can just make us use our brains in a different way. Uh, stress reduction. Play can be a great stress reliever. And that's one of the reasons that um, if there's lots going on in the world like there has been over the last few years, it's been quite a nice way just to start the class um, with this. It encourages people to laugh. Um, and I don't know how many people have told me that they haven't laughed in a while, which is actually a bit sad. Because when we think about how often children laugh, wouldn't it be cool if we could all laugh more? Um, laughter, of course, um, helps us release feel-good endorphins and these are natural mood boosters so laughing is really good for us. Um, reduced stress levels promote a better sense of um, overall well-being. Play can bring you into the present really quickly um, and when we're in the present we have less stress, less overwhelm and less anxiety so these are things that 
you know, people bring with them to a class, but once they're in the present, those things are gone. Um, and it might only be for a short time, but it's still positive. Social interaction. So play doesn't always, but often will involve socialising, which is crucial for our emotional health. If you have tuned into, I think there's a Netflix doco now, but any of the research around blue zones of the world where people tend to live for a much longer period of time, you will have seen that social connection and social interaction is crucial for living a long, healthy life. Um, it helps combat loneliness and isolation, which is often massive for our older adults. It promotes a sense of belonging and also connection. Our community classes are incredible at doing this. You know, you're already fostering that community and that connection. And, you know, your class might have a morning tea afterwards, which again is enhancing that, which is really awesome. But you might find that there's, you know, a new person or a person who kind of stands back and doesn't attend those morning teas. If you can get them to participate in some kind of play or game during the session, they may just foster a relationship with someone that allows them to feel safer, then they're more likely to take part in the social element, the coffee, the, the chat afterwards. Um, and then they might also go on outside of that to take on, you know, different groups or just be more willing to try something new. Our physical activity, which is what most of us kind of do in our classes. Um, obviously, some of the games we're going to play, the last one wasn't hugely physical. Some of them can be a lot more physical. And if you've got a really physical group, then that, you know, that just allows a different kind of um, way to ch challenge people physically. We tend to, I guess, live our lives no matter what age, except for probably children, in a very linear way. You know, we walk in a straight line. If we're cycling, again, it's we don't usually step from side to side and we don't use our body in the way it's designed. You know, our shoulders recognise 16,000 positions. But I think if you looked at yourself over the last week, you've probably barely touched 100 or 150 of those. And so play encourages us to move in an unstructured way and move in ways that we might not necessarily, uh, which then makes us stronger in different directions. So if we're caught off guard or, you know, we have to turn in a hurry, we're just possibly going to be that much more stable. Um, it also helps us if we are enjoying it to remain active, and that's obviously going to help our mobility, our strength, our coordination, our agility, our power, um, and in turn, independence as well, which is kind of I guess the whole aim of this is to keep, keep our older adults upright and independent. Enhance creativity. So um, again, going back to the brain use, and we talked a little bit about this, or Joanna talked a little bit about this last week, being playful, depending on the game again, is going to enhance or encourage creative thinking. And again, sometimes different life stages, different use of creativity. Some people in their older years are very creative. Others have got a routine and that's what they do. And so there's less need for that creative thinking. But creative thinking, imagination, all really important um, and might help someone to explore something new or go back and do something that they used to enjoy. Um, so, yeah, it's just using our brain in a way that um, we don't use it as much as we age. Uh, improved relationships fits in a little bit with your social interaction, but playful interactions with family and friends can strengthen your relationships because of the shared laughter and the endorphins. In an experience like that, you're actually more likely to create positive, strong bonds with someone. Um, those, you know, endorphins are really powerful. And if you've done a session with a game or two in it, I am always gobsmacked and sometimes I have to put my fingers in my ears because the chatter and the laughter after a game is next level and not only that some of the topics that then come up oh geez I do actually have to close my ears be and they're having the best time but they will just their conversations deepen um they're just a lot more open with each other um which again is going to foster and deepen those relationships Emotional resilience. Um, 
in a game situation, we don't always have to have winners and losers. Um, and you will know within your group whether promoting a winner and a loser is a positive thing or not. Um, in most of these games, you can completely use your own kind of, I guess, thoughts around that. You know, you can have winners and losers if you want. If you prefer to just play the game for what it is, then that's 100% okay as well. But it's providing an older adult or any adult with a challenging situation and teaching them how to cope with that and showing them that um, being resilient and being adaptable um, and being aware is going to allow them to process those feelings. So it might be that, you know, they didn't win or they didn't do as well as they thought they were going to do. But that they can then see that that feeling of, of discomfort is temporary. All right. And so then they can take that. And it's something I'll often talk about. You know, if someone's struggling, why are they struggling? And, you know, the positives that come from that, um, taking that out into into the world outside the class. So celebrating success and commiserating and learning new skills is all something that's encouraged a lot when we're little, but I don't know, I almost never go through some of those feelings now. Um, and so bringing them in and just making them aware of it and also letting them know of the importance of that is quite, quite helpful going forwards. Quality of life, obviously, um, all the things that we've already talked about will enhance someone's quality of life. But engaging in activities that they enjoy, whether that be class or horse riding or going for coffee and embracing a playful attitude will lead to an, lead to an improved quality of life. It adds joy, it adds a sense of purpose um, for everyday life. And that's what we want. We want every day to kind of be joyful um, and, you know, have some good stuff in it because that allows us to get out of bed with a spring the next day and, and do it all over again. Reduced ageism, embracing play and playfulness challenges stereotypes about ageing. It reinforces the idea that life can be vibrant and enjoyable at any age. And most of us probably see that in our classes and we're well aware of it, but um, older adults often face the negative stereotypes around aging. And so this just allows them to, you know, possibly take some time where they don't feel old and they don't feel like they are, um, you know, meeting those negative stereotypes of, of aging. Um, and it may also allow them to then look outside. And if you've got a group where, you know, they used to be basketballers or netballers or something like that, and you incorporate a ball into class, it takes them back there. Um, and whether or not they then go and enrol in a walking netball team, I've had a group do that, that just kind of came together after class and decided that there was walking netball on offer for six weeks, so they would go and do that. Um, but it just can bring them extra enjoyment, let go of those negative stereotypes and take them to a time when there was fond memories. Brain health. So we've kind of covered this a little bit with um, cognitive challenges. But using different areas of the brain potentially reduces your risk of cognitive decline and age-related diseases like dementia. And if you talk to your groups, this is often high on their thoughts. They don't want to go down this path. Um, and some of the research recently is, you know, says that Sudokus and crosswords are great, but if we can actually lift a heart rate while challenging the brain, we're going to have a better overall effect. Um, and so play is usually quite good at putting the two together. And finally, spiritual spiritual fulfillment. So some forms of play, um, meditation, mindfulness, colouring can promote spiritual growth and fulfillment, providing a sense of purpose and inner peace to someone. We do quite a lot of breathing in class, which is great not only for those who might be challenged by things like asthma, um, but it's also, you know, the way we speak about it um, can reduce or allow them tools to cope with things like anxiety and bringing calm. Um, breathing is something that I said I do do a lot of. I don't always do it in a playful manner, but if you, you know, are talking about, say, breathing and you want to encourage a long out breath in comparison to in breath, 
then using stupid words like spaghetti. You know, you want two spaghettis in and four spaghettis out. And so you're just, it's not a game. Um, it's just allowing them to take a little bit of a, an everyday, not so exciting task and make it a little bit more fun. All right, so that's our benefits. Um, and I just want to finish that off. Um, Charles Schaefer, the psychologist and father of play therapy, says we are never fully, more fully alive, more completely ourselves, or more deeply engrossed in anything than when we are playing. And I think that's quite true, that we can completely lose ourselves and whatever's going on and have enjoyment. All right, so classes or activities you can do inside your classes. I'm going to uh, cover some kind of partner two or three buddy type um, games, and then we'll go through and look at some group, bigger group type games. Um, depending on your class, your class size, your participants, um, hopefully there's something that you can take away. What we'll do is um, we'll talk about the game itself. Um, we'll talk about some regressions and progressions that you could try. Um, ways to introduce it. So if you've, you know, if you're really new to games, how can I introduce this without making it too overwhelming? Um, and then I'll, there's a short video of all of them as well, so you can kind of see them in practice. Just a quick disclaimer: the vid, the videos I didn't take with um, my class. The hall we use is very dark, and getting consent from everyone wasn't that easy to be filmed and shared with you all. Um, and so I actually did this with my workmates. Um, and it was really interesting. Um, it gave me a new sense of, I guess, introducing these games because most of them hadn't played it before. And so how was I going to simplify it and get them to play the actual game right now? Um, and also because they're a little bit younger, um, their lives are different. It was quite interesting, especially in one of the relays, you'll see they did things that I've not seen any of my classes do, um, but something to be aware of. So, you'll, you know, you're always learning. Um, if you've got people in your class that don't want to participate, don't feel comfortable participating, some of the things that you can try is starting with a less playful activity. So, the dual tasking one that we'll go through soon, um, you could do that without any real play um, and you could make it quite purposeful and take the play out of it. The other thing that can be quite handy depending on your participants is to talk to them about why you're doing it. You know, we've just gone through all the benefits and as we go through each game, feel free to think in your head, oh, this one's doing this and this one's doing this and this is how it would benefit them. Because sometimes if we know why we're doing something, we're much more likely to buy into it. Um, there's the dual tasking activity that we're going to go through shortly. Um, I had two or three people in a class that just thought this was garbage. Um, and it didn't really matter how much I said to them, you know, it's good for this, it's good for this, it's good for this. One of the other ladies came in one day and she said, oh, she said, I'm so glad that we do that activity because she said, I just had to go for my driver's license. They asked me to name 15 animals in 30 seconds. And she said, because of what we'd been doing, I could do it. And I passed. Um, and so then because they were like, oh, do I need to do this for my license? Um, there was much better buy in. So choose what's going to work for you and your participants. Um, and if it doesn't work, either try something else or, you know, talk through some of those things. The other thing that I find quite useful is providing them with a tool. So whether it be a ball or balloon or something that they have to focus on, brings them into the present and takes away some of those, oh my God, this is so embarrassing type um, thoughts that they might have. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to go through and troubleshoot some of those ideas, um, you know, later, if you like. All these notes and videos will be available, um, and I'll send them out with the recording. So if you want to have a look at them again, um, you can. So these ones are all um, for peers and buddies. The first one, I think, is one, two, three. Yeah. All right, so this is a partner game. It's going to challenge people mentally, physically, socially. Um, 
basically they're standing facing each other. I usually will encourage them to communicate with each other whether they want to hold eye contact. If they do, that's awesome. If they don't, that's fine as well. And what they're going to do is alternatively count one, two, three. So person one starts with one, person two says two, person one says three. And then it's just one, two, three, one, two, three. And I'll often preface this the first time by saying, this is easy, all you need to be able to do is count to three and they all go, oh yeah, that's really easy. And then they go to do it and they realize that they actually can't count to three because they start going four or five or they get all muddled up. Um, and so they're already having a little bit of a laugh about it. Um, so what you're gonna do then, it's a little bit like the bingo song, you remove one number, replace it with an action. So you might say, um, the first round they're just gonna practice numbers. The second round they're going to remove the number one, but they're gonna take a squat instead. So it now looks like squat, two, three, squat, two, three. And then as you go on, as they feel comfortable, you remove another number, you know, and they might be doing, for two, they might do two claps. Um, so now they're doing squat, two claps, and three. And they usually find that quite hard. So adding a physical activity to a brain number is quite challenging. But when you get to um, the three physical challenges, it's usually back to being kind of easy. So we'll have a quick look at the video. I think this is just him starting off. They had played this once before the film. But even when you're 24, you forget how to count. So you can obviously make that. You can change out your one, two, three for Tahiru Atoru. It could be ABC. It could be red, blue, green. Um, and then obviously the world is your oyster with your activity. So if you've got a really active group, they might be squat jumping. You could do all sorts of things with that. Um, again, you could clap and stomp, leg slap. It doesn't have to be physical. Um, and you can do it seated as well, obviously. So if you've got a group that they prefer to be seated, they can just sit facing each other and go through exactly the same cycle. So sitting or standing doesn't matter too much with that one. Um, and most of them actually you can adapt for seated or standing groups. The next one, I think, oh yeah, throw, squat, call. So this one is dual tasking, um, which Lily's going to talk about in a couple of weeks with her session. Um, this one here, we started off quite uh, simply. So initially I gave them a ball. This is in class and we just passed the ball backwards and forwards. So some people actually threw the ball to each other. Some people would actually physically take the ball from the other person because they didn't feel comfortable throwing it. Um, and again, those who were seated just threw the ball as well or passed it, whatever they felt most comfortable with, depending on their hand-eye coordination. Once they were comfortable with that, we added in a squat throw. So they're now, as you can see, Emma's about to do, squat and throw, and then they're gonna squat and throw the ball back. There are still some at this point who want to pass the ball to each other rather than throw. Um, and then we added in uh, the alphabet. So each time they let go of the ball, they've got to work their way from A to Z through a topic. So the one that I use a little bit because it's in our local anyway, I'm not sure if it's national, but driver's licenses is animals. Um, we've also tried fruit and vegetables, names, colors, plants, countries, capital cities, um, books, songs, you know it name it we've tried it so um, we'll just have a quick look at this but again can be done seated and standing and it's quite interesting how creative they'll get with this one if they get stuck with a letter uh, you might get small country for s for countries and you might get a like a large apple for l for fruits and vegetables so it's actually quite good at using their creativity as well i can't actually remember whether they got to the end of the alphabet all right, we'll go on to um, the next one. So high fives, again, seated or standing, or if you've got a really active group, sideways movement for two or three steps in each direction, depending on space, is quite good to challenge their spatial awareness and their balance as well. Um, and all they're doing with this one is mirror imaging each other. So you'll have some people who are comfortable to actually connect and tap hands, and you'll have others who prefer to just, um, you know, mirror image, but without touching. 
So depending on the ability of your group, if you've got a seated group, they're obviously not going to move too much. Um, if there's arms on the chairs, just make them aware of those. Um, if you've got a group that's quite active, encourage them to really stretch and to make each other bend. Um, and then again, you can you know get them to sidestep as well. So making it work for your group. If they are super good, you'll get them able to cross body as well, but that might come later on. Alrighty, capture the flag. This is this game's got loads of names. Um, again, you can do it seated or standing. And depending on what prop you've got, um, you know, you're just gonna adapt it. So um, I used, I think, a ball or a balloon for this session. I've had a session where people really wanted to play it. I wasn't prepped. I didn't have any gear. We used each other's drink bottles. So um, be quite flexible um, with how this one runs. And basically, um, you've possibly seen this one with, with kids. Um, they're going to face each other with a chair in between them. If you've got a group that are happy going to the ground, you can put your prop on the ground. Um, I did it with a chair just because most of my groups don't have the ability to get up and down quickly. And this is what this game requires. So there's quite a bit of agility um, and speed and reaction time in this one. So all you're gonna do as a leader is get them to face each other. Just make them aware if the chair's got arms, the chair's got a back that they need to kind of keep their hands in and be aware of that. Um, and then you're just going to make calls. So, you you know, they might want to be doing some punches or some squats or um, keep them active. And then when you call ball or bottle or balloon or whatever you've got, it's the first one to grab that balloon who's going to take it home. All righty. Um, and you can, you know, play best of three or best of five or just give them one chance and that's it. Um, totally up to you. Uh, but this is what it looks like from a chair perspective. Easy peasy. So um, last one here for um, for buddy games or peer games or games of, you can do it in threes. The only one I wouldn't do in threes is one, two, three, because it's way too easy. Um, you're always doing the same word or the same action. If you haven't got noodles, things like a rolled up cardboard, you know, the handy towel insert or a rolled up magazine can be quite good as well. Um, challenging their balance and then depending on how energetic your group is, what their balance is like, you can then challenge them with a bit of a sword fight. Just be aware that this can get uh, pretty full on pretty quick, uh, regardless of how gentle you encourage them to go, um, because there can be quite a lot of competition. So initially I um, go through some balanced positions, offer them to choose one that they feel comfortable to do some movement with. Um, and then they're just going to gently, you know, reach out from that position. So depending on if they've got great balance, you're going to move them further apart. So they've got to use their, you know, their center of gravity a little bit more. Otherwise, keep them quite close. Um, you can do a similar sort of thing without challenging their balance for a group who's seated as well. Um, if they don't want to do the violent sword fighting, then even in their balanced position, they can take that noodle or that um, cardboard roll up over their head. They're going to try and grab it or drop it to the other hand and then pass it back over. So you're getting them to balance while choosing their shoulder mobility and then going around the middle as well in both directions. Um, so this is what these guys look like. I think it got, uh, we didn't, we, they were meant to be in a balanced position. Um, they're not that balanced. They were too busy trying to fight each other. But you'll often find that it's a good communication tool for them just to talk first about how vigorous they do or don't feel, whether they want the contact like this or not. And of course, if they get wobbly, they can always put a foot down. Uh, group games. So um, these obviously best done in a group. Depending on the game, you'll find if you've got a group of 20, you might want to make two or three smaller groups so that there's more activity, less waiting around. Um, and you might be familiar with some of these as well. So the first one is one that's actually quite good. Um, I often use it as an opener as well. It just brings people out of their shells quite quickly. Um, and 
you can, I'll, I'll talk through the seated option after you've seen it perhaps. So first level is what these guys are doing. Oh, sorry, your highest level is what these guys are doing. They are basically given no instructions except to walk and to only gently tap each other's bottoms with the noodle. So that's what the initial instruction was for my workmates. And this is them. So that's probably for a fairly active group. That one's good. If you've got a group who are a little bit less active and you're worried about things like fast changes of direction, what I'll often get them to do then is pair up in twos. And they're almost playing a game of walking tag. They'll walk in one direction. When they get tagged, they both need to stop. They need to maybe tap their shoulders and their knees so that they've kind of got themselves into that mindset, I'm going to turn direction. Then they turn and the other person's in charge or the other person's chasing. Again, you can tell them to walk as much as you like. It doesn't always play out with walking. Um, it can often get a little bit fierce. Um, and then for your seated group, I will usually um, place people in groups of two or three with a bean bag or something smaller. The cardboard rolls work for this as well. And you might call elbow, and so they've gently got to tap the person's elbow or shoulder to their left or to their right. Um, so that would be how I would adapt that one for those who are seated. This one here, um, I don't use balloons a lot these days um, in terms of their environmental impact, but I do, if I am going to use them, I make sure I use them a lot. And or depending on what I'm doing with them, I'll put a cover over them so that you can buy like a little or get a cover made, which is just light material, which gives them a little bit more robustness. Um, I do have one person in one of my classes who's fearful of balloons. We don't use them at all in there. Um, but this is really, uh, it's quite a cognitive challenge. Doesn't look like it, doesn't feel like it, um, but it actually, they're using their brains quite a lot. Um, all it is is a basic relay to start with, and then I layer instructions on top. So initially, they're just in groups of um, three or four in terms of like at each end of the room. And obviously, depending on your space and your people, you might want to go width or length ways. Um, if you want them to do less activity, you're going to have a bigger group at each end to allow for more rest time. But the first instruction I give is that you need to get the balloon from one end to the other as fast as you feel comfortable. Um, so we'll have a look at it and then we'll look at some of the layers that we add on afterwards. I will have to, they'll often jam it up the jumpers or, you know, tuck it under an armpit or, um, yeah, lots of different ideas for that one. Alrighty, so our next couple are quite similar. Uh, they're done in a circle um, and you may have done these ones before. Um, some of them are drinking games, some of them are games you might have done as children. This one's whiz boy and bounce with arms. Um, you can also adapt it to do with legs. We had Sammy in the wheelchair, um, and so this would be perfect for any group seated or standing. Um, and we'll have a little so if uh, you're basically moving an invisible object around the, the group, and so whiz is going to obviously pass it in this direction. If you want to change direction, you've got a boing, stop it, and the next person's going to chase it back that way. And if you want to skip your buddy, it's bounce and it's going to go over their head. So, and keep going. So, um, we'll watch this one and then I'll let you adapt it for legs. The legs is quite good for your balance. If you, I mean, some of the ways you can adapt it is like a toe tap to each side, uh, a squat, a jump, a calf, uh, sorry, a calf raise. Um, to move that invisible object around the room. So uh, that's some of the ways to adapt that one. For a standing or a seating group. Fizz bars, this is my least favourite because I'm not a fan of maths. Um, again, you're going to move around the group. Fizz, we initially started with fizz being any number with a three in it. And buzz was any number with a five in it. So they had to go around the circle and fizz or buzz. So count one, two, fizz, three, four, buzz, um, and keep going. We then lay it in uh, multiples of three as well. So you'll, they're kind of thinking ahead to work out what their number is. Um, so we'll have a quick look at this one. So we added physical activity to this as well with a squat for one and a jump for the other. 
paper, scissors, rock. Um, some people will be familiar with this one. It's really well known with school kids. You might have to spend some time, um, depending on your participants, instructing them over normal um, paper, rock, scissors. So if you're not familiar, this is a rock. Rock beats scissors. Scissors cuts paper. Alrighty, and so on the count of one, two, three, or whatever agreed uh, one, two, go, it is. In buddies, you would reveal what your choice is. Um, for some people, uh, just that is going to be enough, and it's going to take you three or four classes to get the hang of that. Um, once you've got the hang of that, you can have a paper, you can have scissors, and you can have a rock as well. So you can do it with full body actions for a group that feels comfortable. Uh, for some, you might want to, you know, just getting through it and then changing partners is good because they'll find that they'll learn what each other's ways of doing it is. For others, you might want to take the two winners from one pair to play and the two losers from the same pair to play against each other. So you can work kind of that one out um, depending on your group, but just allow for the fact that there might be, you know, half your group who haven't played paper or scissors before. And I'm on the wrong activity, but that's all right. So this is who done it. Terry's in the middle. He's trying to work out who started the movement. He needs to find out who's starting the movement. Again, seated or standing. I'd usually allow them two guesses and then switch them out and put someone else in. If you've got a group who aren't familiar with games, this is quite a hard one because it's putting someone out on their own. So I'll go straight into this one. If you're familiar with paper, scissors, rock, paper, rock, scissors, however you want to say it. So the first one is just them. And you can see one of that pair don't have played before. Where so these guys are experts. Sort of. And you can play a winner of one, winner of two, winner of three, whatever you kind of feel like for your group. And then the last one is noughts and crosses, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, some groups will play this on the ground, some groups will play this um, on the wall, depending either using a pen or some sticky tape. Um, but one player one move and you've got two separate teams pretty easy this one so they're just trying to get three in a row So um, I just thought I'd finish off with a quick summary and um, in the words of Stuart Brown, um, who has pretty much dedicated his life to uh, finding out about human play, um, what it is, how it affects us and the detrimental consequences of suppressing it. He says, those who play really become brittle in the face of stress or lose the healing capacity for humour. So I guess thinking about your own comfort level before you choose what's going to work for you. Feel positive and safe about it. Um, take your participants into account. Obviously, you know, you're going to, you will know straight off without even starting who's going to be open to it, who's not. Um, and have fun with it, right? It's about play um, and you can't do it wrong. 
so make it work for for you guys um thank you so much any questions any comments um please let me know um and yeah you can i will we'll flick out the recording in the notes later on <laughs> Fantastic, Hilary. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions, team? Um, just pop them in the chat. We've uh, got a few more minutes to stick on if everyone can. Uh, brilliant recommendation there from Anne Marie saying um, doing paper, scissors, rock with the non dominant hand. That would be that's awesome. Yeah. Putting on your undies the other leg first is always good. <laughs> so just get them to sit down first and not in class, get them to do that when they're at home. Yeah. Especially if you've had a hip replacement, that's a tricky one. I can say that from experience. Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. Any other questions, team? Um, I think a lot of people have got a dash, Hills. Just lots of thank yous coming in, Hillary. Definitely took me back to some uh, sports coaching days, some of those did. No questions have come through, so that's great. You obviously, just a breadth of knowledge there, Hills. You've inspired everyone. Um, so. Just thank you so much, um, Hilary. I know I learned tons of stuff and I can't wait to try this on some of my groups. Uh, this is just going to be hilarious and they're going to love it. Um, yes, yeah, and then coming through. Um, for the next session, just reminding everyone, we've got the amazing Lily um, and she's going to be doing a session on dual tasking. So it's a fun, again, really, really important to the work we do in falls prevention. Um, and just a quick reminder that the emails will come through for every single uh, educational series separately. So you do have to register to each one um, and make sure you click the link and register. So make, they will be coming through from your lead agents um, and just remember to register. Otherwise, the link is too old because it's from the previous one. All right. Um, if everyone, if there's no more questions to come through, I will finish with the karakia, if that's OK. Fire, fire, fire te tika, fire te pono, fire te aroha, mō te orangatangata, ki a puta, ki te pai au, ki te au mārama, homie, huie, tai kie. Ka kite, everyone.